Hello and guests, uh, uh, thank you very much. I count it an honour to be able to contribute here today and uh, I'm glad to be here with this topic, not just here, but this is society, but also even more generally in London because uh, at a time when I'd never set foot in England uh, or, in, or in London, it was the need to see the Irish Bells in the British Museum and the Wallace Collection that first brought me here in the context of an MA thesis that I embarked on in 1979 in Dublin. And as for the society, well, just a while later, uh, I was enrolled for a year at University College, and uh, James Graham Campbell kindly gave me a letter of introduction to John Hopkins, whom some of you will remember. And uh, on the strength of that, I was able to spend many a productive hour in the library upstairs. <coughs> now, the bells that are my, my subject today are a medieval insular manifestation of what I suppose is a global phenomenon. I haven't pursued their ultimate origin, although their proximate origin is certainly of interest to us. <coughs> so to sum up then uh, the, 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 some essentials, uh, these are ecclesiastical handbells uh, made between the 5th and or 6th century and the 12th. <coughs> and we know that they're ecclesiastical because they're represented occasionally on high crosses, because several have been enshrined as relics of the saints, uh, because several have been uh, handed down in cont continuous by continuous transmission with attributions to the saints, uh, and because there's a wealth of documentary evidence for the context of their production and use. And there are two principal classes, which are those on the screen, uh, what I call classes one and two, uh, class one on the left, sheet iron, class uh, two on the right, of cast copper alloy or bronze for convenience. But we can also isolate uh, four other classes, three, four, five, and six, all of them of copper alloy, uh, smaller bells that survive in smaller numbers and are of late 11th and early 12th century date. Now these last, the last four classes are Irish only, but classes one and two are a phenomenon of Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and England. And they're the ones I'll dwell on uh, this evening. <coughs> now, uh, I've suggested that these bells span the period between the fifth or sixth century and the 12th, but we can refine this chronology. So class one iron bells come first. They continue to be made until it seems around the 10th century, and the ending of their production may have coincided uh, with the first instances of enshrinement. And class two copper alloy bells, which were never enshrined, uh, were certainly made in the 9th century, probably began to be produced in the 8th century and continued to be made until the 12th. <coughs> Thus, in terms of their production then, the two classes are only partly coincident in time and as we'll see, they're likewise only partly coincident in space. And uh, class two alone is represented on the continent in the form of just four bells that were imported to Brittany from either Cornwall or Wales. <coughs> now all of these bells, uh, classes one and two, are quadrangular. They have two faces on two sides and uh, they're made to a, uh, uh, class one, the iron bells were made to a, a standard design that is consistent throughout the geographical range all the way from the south of Ireland to the north of Scotland. And the key aspects in making the iron bell um, is that <coughs> It's always made like this, from a single sheet of double trapeze form. It's always symmetrically jointed, and by that I mean that the surfaces in, in one joint are in the same relative position in the other joint. Uh, also, what's standard is the, the use uh, of about three rivets, typically uh, in each side with disc-like heads, and uh, the presence of a handle and suspension loop made in one piece, the suspension loop for the internal clapper. Uh, likewise, standard is the presence of a copper alloy coat, coating inside and out, and evidence for the brazing process, the brazing and covering of these bells with copper alloy is now forthcoming from a 7th century context at uh, Longfad in County Westmeath, where numerous pieces of what are called brazing shrouds, vitrified clay envelopes have been found, as I say, in a 7th century context, and some of the bigger and better pieces here articulated uh, 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 virtually on the screen. And what's on the right is a reverse engineered model of the interior surface created by Gary Devlin of the Discovery Program. It allows you to see an image on the right of the vanished bell. <coughs> and on the right hand side of that image, you see the vertical joint and, and the rivet heads. <coughs> Class two bells were made by lost wax casting. And both the application of the copper alloy to class one bells and the casting of class two bells have been replicated very informatively in the last 10 or 15 years. It's arguable, I think, that uh, 
class one bells are the most accomplished examples of sheet iron working made in Ireland or Britain in the early Middle Ages, bearing in mind that these iron bells, the larger ones, can be up to 30 centimetres tall, sometimes slightly more than that, excluding the handles. So that calls for sheets up to 70 centimetres long, 35 centimetres wide, consistently four to six millimetres thick, and of consistent composition, beaten out from a single charge of, of uh, red hot iron and a uh, single operation. And the class two bells include the largest uh, single castings attempted during the same period. Um, uh, specifically, these three bronze bells with engraved ornament in ninth century style, uh, which, uh, as I mentioned, can, these three are uh, something in the region of 30 centimetres tall without the handles. Now, as I've said, these bells are ecclesiastical, and so they fall, they fall within a corpus of early medieval metalwork that uh, preeminently in Ireland includes things like croziers and book shrines and uh, tomb-shaped shrines, some of which have been transmitted continuously uh, in an unbroken line since the 10th century. Uh, and on the other hand, we can point to a, a corpus of broadly speaking secular uh, metalwork that includes literally hundreds of brooches, for example, some of which must have been heirlooms in their day. And indeed, Geoffrey Keating in the 17th century, he specifically says that elaborate brooches were transmitted through the lines of Irish kings. And no doubt this is factual, but all such transmission ended in the Middle Ages. And 100% of the corpus of our secular metalwork has been recovered from the ground or from underwater. And this is uh, certainly true of Ireland and Scotland, and I suspect it applies to these islands overall. So the ecclesiastical then differs essentially from the secular, and within the former category, the bells have a further distinction, apart from the, the technical distinction of their manufacture, but the <coughs> distinction that they outnumber everything else. So we have taken the two classes, one and two together, with 97 of these extant from Ireland, 19 from Scotland, six from Wales, and two from England, both of the English examples being class one iron bells, as well, of course, as uh, a wealth of evidence for the former existence of several other bells. And what's exceptional as well is the nature of the transmission of these things in the many cases in which tran continuous tra transmission applies. <coughs> the keepers of bells in Ireland were latterly the descendants of what we call Aaronach families, that's an anglicisation of an Irish word, that is, these were typically lay holders of ecclesiastical sites and lands who were deprived of tenure at the Reformation or the 17th century, but who held on to the portable insignia, the portable accessories to the cults of medieval saints. In Scotland and Wales, by contrast, of course, the acceptance of the Reformation by the majority ensured continuity of worship on the ancient sites and continuity of ownership of cult accessories. <coughs> now, obviously, these were destroyed wholesale when deemed idolatrous or subversive of the new regime, but bells in the main escaped this fate. They weren't visited with that same opprobrium, and so they, they escaped destruction. It's true that in 1536 at Repton in Derbyshire, the Reformation commissioners documented, and maybe they destroyed, the bell of the mercy in St. Gothlac, which the faithful were putting on their heads to cure headaches. And in 16th century Lincolnshire, sacking bells were both used as animal bells and adapted as mortars. But it seems, at least in Scotland and Wales, that bells being formerly innocuous things were retained in churches for the purpose of signalling and funeral accompaniment. And I suspect it was funeral accompaniment in particular that was the key factor in ensuring their preservation by tacit consensus. And that's a funerary application that finds very late expression here in some uh, tombstones from, headstones from Fermanagh and Monaghan, showing class two, what I take to be class two bronze bells among uh, otherwise stock memento mori symbols. These must have been bells that were famed locally, but were certainly of early medieval date. <coughs> it's striking, however, that several Scottish bells, and perhaps one of those in Wales, retained their attributions to medieval saints. And thus has it come about that early medieval handbells were typically the possession of Catholics in post-Reformation Ireland, and in three cases are still in Catholic parishes, the vast majority, of course, being in museums. Whereas in Wales and Scotland, they're the property, respectively, of the representative body of the Church in Wales, part of the Anglican Communion, and of, the, of Presbyterian Kirk sessions. Now, this can't be said of any other category of medieval, early medieval ecclesiastical metalwork in these islands, that the, there's this parallel transmission in the three different confessions. In other words, handbells then have been singled out by some kind of unspoken consensus as being uniquely significant, uniquely 
hallowed by association and uniquely deserving of being handed down. This is exceptional, I think, in European, if not global terms. And if we allow very conservatively three generations for every one of the 15 centuries between, say, the 6th century and the present day, that's to recognize the custodial role of 45 generations in the transmission of our oldest iron bells, and perhaps 60 generations would really be closer to the mark. Now, um, the subject has long attracted attention, and leaving aside the medieval tradition, we find reference to bells as what we would call archaeological objects as early as the 18th century. Among the first uh, is uh, a record by Richard Pocock, of course a fellow of this society, who acquired in 1758 a bell found in County Kerry. He described it as a handbell about 15 inches long, made of iron, riveted together and a copper handle, but almost all destroyed with rust and he suggested that it served to ring the monks to their several duties. And this sets a pattern then, in that commentators were frequently collectors, notably for Ireland, uh, Thomas Cook, whose collection went to the British Museum, John Bell, Scottish by birth, whose collection went back to the Antiquities of Scotland, and George Petrie, whose collection went to the Royal Irish Academy. These and other collectors sometimes, of course, competed with each other, and John Bell has the distinction of having published the very first, the earliest published uh, illustration of an Irish bell in 1815, and <clears throat> George Petrie was appointed to the topographical department of the Ordnance Survey in Dublin in 1835, and the field workers of the survey then encountered several bells on their keepers as they travelled around Ireland. And the question then arises, specifically for Ireland, where so many of these bells are preserved, why objects for so long jealously guarded were finally relinqu relinquished in a short space and in such large numbers? This is in the 19th century. The answer, I think, must lie largely in the culture of this location to which Ireland was subject in the 19th century. Something attributable to starvation, disease, emigration, urbanization, the accelerated loss of the Irish language, and the suppression by uh, a centralizing Catholic Church of popular devotional observances. And the Great Famine of 1845 to 52 was, of course, the Great Watershed. Inevitably, uh, we can document several instances of. Uh, people needing to sell the bell that they've kept in order to pay their passage to America. That's specifically recorded of one bell by, by William Wilde, and we can uh, multiply those instances where either starvation or destitution are specifically named as the reason for the selling of the bell uh, out of the uh, keeper's hands. And um, Furthermore, the famine must have undermined also the practice of bell ringing at funerals, uh, and further weakened keepers' resolve. And uh, in the words again of William Wilde, writing this time in 1852, he said all the domestic usages of life have been outraged. And he goes on to say that even the ceremony of religion has been neglected, and the very rites of sepulture have been neglected or forgotten. The dead body has rotted where it fell or has been thrown without prayer or mourning into the adjoining ditch. So here then, a key factor whereby so many Irish bells left the hands of hereditary keepers Enter the cabinets of collectors and then came ultimately into the hands of professional museum curators. Now, these commentators that I've named were, in a manner of speaking, taking up where others had left off, and in the 17th century, uh, we find the Irish hagiographer writing in Belgium, John Colgan writing in Belgium, in respectful terms of bells that uh, crop up repeatedly in the lives of the saints that he was collating. And the hagiographical tradition goes back at least to the tripartite life of Patrick in the 9th century, uh, in which the saint, uh, we uh, encounter the saint, dis the saint dispersing devils on Pope Patrick of the Mountain County Mayo mm -hmm. by uh, throwing his bell, and in which we find another bell is uh, uh, advanced as a relic of, of St. Patrick. But we can go yet further back, finding in the 7th century, out of Nan's life of Columba, that the bell is not a miracle working agent, it's straightforwardly uh, an accessory to monastic regulation. His references are incidental, but in another 7th century text known as the Alphabet of Piety, we find that tardiness at the bell is specified as a breach of monastic discipline. So these and several other indicators show that Pocock was right in thinking that, in initial terms at least, the handbell served to ring the monks to their several duties. But this is not something that the Irish invented, and we can trace the same usage 
uh, back at least to the early 6th century in North Africa and southern Italy on the evidence of a letter written by Ferrandus of Carthage to Eugippius of Lucumanum. He recommends the whole, what he calls the holy custom among monks of ringing a bell to call for prayers. He uses the word campana. This is the variation on the regime uh, prescribed in the 4th century rule attributed to the Egyptian Pacomius, the famous monastic founder, uh, who prescribes the use of a trumpet uh, to call monks from their cells. Tuba in, La in German's uh, Latin translation. And the life of the monastic founder Benedict, written around 600 by Gregory the Great, mentions a bell, this time called, this time tintinabulum, uh, tied to a rope uh, by a monk in order to signal the delivery of bread to uh, St. Benedict while he's living in a cave. One wonders, is this uh, anticipatory of the use of the refectory bell which was to become standardized in monastic communities. And Benedict himself almost certainly had bell ringing in mind when he referred in his own monastic rule to signa, or regulatory signs, signum, another standard Latin term, uh, medieval Latin term for bell. And that a stone thrown by a devil breaks Benedict's bell in Gregory's life might also be anticipatory in literary terms of the breaking of Patrick's bell when he throws it at uh, demonic birds on Croft Patrick, as recounted in the Trapartite Life and as represented in this Italian take on, on the incident in the 17th century. But the bells of early continental monasticism were on present evidence, for the most part, round section, and they were made of copper alloy. And although there are a few continental <coughs> iron bells that I'll come back to, there's no evidence that the continental church used iron bells of our class one. Now, the iron bells of our class one are indistinguishable uh, in all their essentials from the iron bells of the Roman provinces, including Britain. What's on the screen is uh, one of a group of about six or eight bells found in a court of tools in eastern France of the late 4th and early 5th century date. They're made exactly as the insular bells are, and we can identify several of these from Roman and British sites, one of 2nd century date from Carlisle, one of third century date from Vindolanda, which I think I have an image of, and uh, another uh, fourth century date from Maiden Castle, and another from the Romano British Cemetery on the east side of Chichester, and a recent paper, a paper in the most recent Britannia, documents a few more Romano British iron bells. Now these are small, they're smaller than the smallest of the insular ecclesiastical examples, but their adaptation to church use involved nothing more than their enlargement, because the, the morphology of the things is established. And by my best guess is this adaptation was carried out in Britain, specifically in Wales, and I point out in that context the, that the establishment of Irish Christianity was largely through Romano-British influence, of which of course Patrick was to... Uh, a prime agent and uh, in traditional terms personification. Irish monasticism certainly, certainly stood in a filial relationship to that of Britain and figures like David and Gildas are remembered as exemplary. So it's reasonably to be concluded that the sheet iron bells were accessories to British Christianity and specifically British monasticism and that the Irish followed British example. And the remarkable standardization of insular iron bells throughout their distribution may in consequence be due in part to their very real association with the earliest days of the church. And indeed, in what may be a recollection of the <coughs> ultimate British origin we find in later saints' lives, the lives of Malaga and Medo, two Irish saints, that they received bells while they were with David in Wales, and he endowed them with the bells which they then brought back to Ireland. Now, the continental iron bells are worth a second glance, um, since uh, I mentioned that there are none of insular type. Now, it's not strictly true because there is just one example which is on the screen that from Ramsach in Bavaria. Uh, but it's not of insular make. It's, uh, I uh, suspect it's a bell uh, made in Bavaria under insular influence. It's attributed to a nominally Irish saint. And um, it seems that it cannot be an export from these islands, but it, it is a continental product. The heads of the rivets uh, are the wrong shape, for example, and there are too many of them, uh, and one or two other technical uh, differences. Uh, German scholarship concurs incidentally and sees this as a one-off product, a uh, one-off certainly in terms of the surviving evidence. Otherwise what we have is a disparate group of just three quadrangular iron bells uh, of, ecclesi 
of ecclesiastical origin, none of which matches another. They're, the three are from Noyon in northern France, from Nassogne in Belgium, and from uh, St. Gallen in Switzerland. I won't dwell on them, but just to give you a flavour, so the Noyon bell is quadrangular, all right, but it's riveted not in the sides, it's riveted on the faces. And of course, we have here multiple riveting, which we never have in the insular uh, iron bells. And in St. Gallen, uh, yes, we have riveting on the sides, all right, but again, we have multiple riveting, which we wouldn't have in the insular series. And as you can see from the plan or section of the mass, the bell is almost oval in plan, whereas our bells are quadrangular. Now, a fourth bell of Cologne, from Cologne in Germany is related to these, but it's uh, octagonal in plan. That's clearest in the view from below on the right-hand side. This is a, a masterpiece of blacksmithing uh, made from three separate sheets. Uh, scarcely to be called a handbell, it's maybe 38 or 40 centimeters high and rather heavy. And it's evidently the counterpart uh, of a cast copper alloy bell, bearing in mind the, the faceted elevation you see there in this bell. It's the counterpart of this uh, a cast copper alloy bell designed for suspension in the Basilica of San Zeno in Verona. This last, uh, there's independent evidence this dates to the 11th century, and I think the same date can apply to the bell in Cologne. So for lack of evidence then, the adaptation of the provincial Roman iron bell to ecclesiastical use can't be attributed to continental churches, but it can reasonably be attributed to British monastic communities since Britain alone has bells of both categories. I think this was an answer, an insular answer to the need for bells, and the continental bells took other forms. And what they look like is suggested by this unique surviving example with 10th century inscription from Cordoba and by fragments from 9th and 10th century context from Hedeby in North Germany. The largest of the bells at Hedeby, um, about 11 centimeters in diameter of the mouth, and Hans Drescher has suggested that it might have approximated. Uh, in shape and in size to those depicted uh, on the Bayeux tapestry. Um, now, all of these are admittedly late, but I would argue that small bells of hemispherical and half ovoid form, made of cast copper alloy, were a continental standard from the time of Ferrandus and Benedict in the 6th century, and they were adapted from provincial Roman bells of the same shape and the same material, and there are plenty of them. Now, given that I'm standing here and not in Ireland, I better say something of the English bells that I mentioned. One, <coughs> there are only two of these. One, uh, an absolute outlier is from the Thames at Mortlake. The other is from Marvin in Herefordshire, just to the north of Hereford itself. The Mortlake bell might have been, I guess, uh, the possession of Irish or Welsh clergy in transit. And the Marvin bell, found within a few miles of the border marked by the Y, can be associated with the Welsh distribution. But <coughs> Given my argument uh, uh, for British priority in the making of class one bells, it would be fair to say what I mean by the Welsh distribution, since there's just one relevant symbol on the map, that's number uh, 77, I think, uh, the bell from Pankenny in Breckenshire, and the neighbouring one, this is in, south, in the southeast of Wales, but the neighbouring symbol on the map is for Martin and Herefordshire. <coughs> so where are, the, where are these Welsh iron bells? I'd answer with the, the distribution of, of lost Welsh bells, um, of which there are 19 examples uh, uh, that were certainly or probably quadrangular and many of which can at least be identified by material. Eight were certainly or probably of copper alloy and two of them band together at Flandeder Goch on Anglesey in the 19th century were certainly of iron. But that leaves another nine that might have been of iron and that might make up uh, the disparity in the extant distribution of Welsh bells. And the lost distribution, incidentally, is of interest for its coastal concentration and the presence of just one bell uh, in mid Wales. <coughs> a word, too, on the Anglo Saxon iron bells is appropriate here. <coughs> First of all, they're relatively few in number from Anglo Saxon contexts, and as a rule, they're even smaller than the uh, smallest of the class one ecclesiastical bells. And those, for example, from burials at Lechlade and Kingston Down were probably, I think, of non Christian talismanic significance. These from burials and equally small bells from Asbury, Winterbuff, and Cumbria, they tend towards a rounded plan, very rounded at the mouth. And this is also true of, the th of three larger bells that are more relevant to us from Tarshall Cork, Flixborough, and Repton, again, that might be argued by some to be ecclesiastical bells, although I don't believe they were. Tarshall Thorpe uh, belongs to a suite of grave goods in what's taken to be the burial of a smith, that Flixborough found with a hoarding tools. 
and the Repton Bell found in, uh, in an almost workshop context in what had been a mortuary chapel, but a, a space that was then cut down to serve as a, a Viking Age burial chamber. And what's more, Touch the Thorpe and Flixborough uh, are reinforced at the lip by clenched mouldings, which our class one bells never are. And that from Flixborough, uniquely uh, in this uh, discussion, is asymmetrically jointed. So the Flixborough bell falls out with the class one definition for that reason. And what's more, Flixborough and Repton uh, both are, are closed at the joints by a single rivet close to the, rip, to the lip, whereas two or three rivets are standard in our class one bells of similar size. So, and to be added into this, uh, into weighing all this up is the fact that no class one bell, with the sole exception of Marvin, has ever been found in an ecclesiastical context in England. As for example, during grave digging in, uh, from early medieval sites that go back to an early medieval origin, which is a standard kind of fine circumstance for Ireland and Scotland. And when we do find a bell attributed to a saint being specifically described, we find that it's made of copper alloy and that it's round section. And I'm referring to the bell uh, described to Cuthbert, who was preserved in Durham and is the subject of an 1800 word allegorical description by Reginald of Durham in the late 12th century. And as for the other lost English bells, Guthflax was probably a bronze and round section, but the rest were presumably uh, quadrangular. Uh, can I go back to that? Uh, presumably quadrangular and made of either iron or, or copper alloy. One which you can see uh, in the vicinity of Glastonbury is a bell preserved at Beckery, uh, just beside, the, beside Glastonbury itself, and preserved uh, as a relic of the Irish saint Bridget, described by William of Malmesbury in the early 12th century. And the other three in, in Cornwall, uh, by being uh, located there are extraneous to the Anglo-Saxon world, and I take them to be continuous with the Welsh and the Breton distribution. So I conclude then that class one bells were emblematic of British ecclesiastical organization and didn't find favor in early Christian England. And Bede describes the British defeat by a pagan Anglo-Saxon king uh, at the Battle of Chester around 615. He describes it as the fulfillment of a prophecy made by Augustine that if the British refused to preach to the English the way of life, they would eventually suffer at their hands the penalty of death. And Bede tells us that the British were supported by the monastic community of Bangor on Dee in Flintshire, and that the monks who had kept a three-day fast had gathered to pray at the battle. Now, since psalm singing and fasting by way of sanction are routinely coupled with bell ringing in Irish sources, it'd be a fair guess, I think, that the monks of Bangor on Dee rang iron handbells at the Battle of Chester, their associations might be all the more negative if the smaller but similar bells that were secreted in Anglo-Saxon graves had had a pagan talismanic significance. And as for what the Anglo-Saxon church used instead, I think the answer must be continental style, half ovoid and hemispherical bronze bells, <clears throat> like that one. Bede, who says the bell ringing at Whitby, uh, was miraculously heard at Hackness, which is about 12 miles inland of there, um, he also has other things to say that are relevant in this context. In his commentary on the tabernacle, Bede remarks on the resonant and vocal qualities of bronze. In his De Templo, he says exactly the same thing, and then goes on for allegorical purposes to mention the practicalities of casting, uh, of casting the vessels of the Lord's house. And he uses the generic term vasa for these vessels, but uh, he obviously is very familiar with the, the, the process of casting and breaking open the mold to free the the, the, the piece within, and although that's a generic vasa, as it happens, is used by Walifred Strabo in the uh, a century later, uh, with specific reference to bells. So class one, then, a phenomenon of the insular Celtic-speaking church, and I'll just look on now to say something about distributions. What we have in Ireland, as you can see on the screen, is a, a pronounced Midland concentration. Uh, the north is not quite as, as thin as it is uh, in this image in as much as there are four on Providence Bells and John Bells, Dungannon, County Tyrone collection, four on Providence Iron Bells that must come from somewhere in the north. So we have then a reasonable northern showing and a very marked Midland concentration and a marked absence in Munster, the southern province. Uh, likewise, South Leinster being largely blank. And when we uh, map the lost bells, we find that this pattern is merely intensified. 
And looking at the class two bronze bells, we find that uh, we have a northern concentration and that County Tyrone, not that the counties matter, but County Tyrone in the middle of Ulster has more bronze bells than any other Irish county, and bronze bells are largely absent outside the north. Um, putting these two together, difficult to know what to make of them. What I would suggest is that um, uh, if we look at what the Irish, the character of the Irish Midlands in the relevant period, uh, we can maybe look at or identify a difference in context because we know we have a chronological distinction. So class one then are concentrated in the Midland Counties, which is uh, an area Francis, the late Francis John Byrne called the Flowering Garden of Monasteries. And he also remarked on the number of churches found in the Midland Counties of Ireland by the saints of Westminster origin. And others of northern origin uh, are also said to have been founders of Midland churches, including Clonfad, from which we have the brazing evidence, uh, brazing iron bells. So then, we, in other words, we have evidence that this is an area of monastic specialization, and the bells could be, if you like, an index of this. Gallon in County Offaly uh, is Gallon of the Britons, to give it its full name. The northern churches, uh, from which most of the bronze bells come, some of them we know in the later Middle Ages as parish churches. None of them are great monastic centres, however you might define that term for the earlier period. And uh, I would posit that they are perhaps to be associated with equipping or re-equipping churches that were incipient parish churches. And this was carried out as an Armagh initiative, because this is very much the hinterland of Armagh. What we're seeing in the right-hand image, Armagh is just south of Loch Ney there at the top right. Uh, of the map of Ireland. So, then, in other words, this is to allow that they had a liturgical function and were accessories to the burial of the laity, and that Armagh was equipping from its own workshops uh, some of these churches, and the output of specific workshops is represented, so we can envisage distribution from them. Um, the population group from which uh, many of the office holders in Armagh were drawn, known as the Ariela, it was also from this population that uh, a certain Kamaskup son of Ada was drawn. He was an office holder Armagh, in Armagh who died in the year 909. He had his death recorded in the annals. His name is written on this bell. This very much brings bronze bell making straight into the Armagh uh, context. And uh, as I say, this man is of the population who were uh, major players in Armagh politics. Uh, the production of these bells is unlikely to have arisen independently anywhere else, so I think that the, the distribution in Wales, Scotland, Brittany is ultimately all to be traced to 8th century Armagh. Uh, for Scotland, we have a smaller number, but you can see that the iron bells on the left hand side are more widely distributed, all the way from the borders to the Orkneys. Uh, the bronze bells are restricted uh, between Fourth Clyde Line and the Great Glen almost as one that creeps over the Great Glen into Loch Shiel. Um, what they were, I think that the iron bells can be explained for Scotland in the same way as they are for Ireland, that they are accessories to monastic timekeeping and regulation. And we have three notably uh, in Perthshire and Glen Lyon. One of them, uh, Fortingal, um, stolen uh, just over a year and a half ago, but from a most uh, interesting area that is uh, rich with uh, association with Iona personnel. And Fortingal itself, uh, from which the bell was taken, uh, is wrapped around by a rectilinear enclosure of 7th century date that corresponds nicely to the enclosure on Iona. So it's as though we have here, particularly in Perthshire, this area, uh, evidence for the monastic houses that Adelman says, though he doesn't name them, he says they were founded from Iona among the Picts. And as for Wales, <coughs> We have a cluster in the north. The cluster in the north is all of the uh, uh, bronze bells, class two bells. And um, I think for reasons of looking at each of them individually, I think all of them uh, were made in Ireland. Uh, just one example from the Fien Peninsula from Clan Granada, but now in Cardiff. We have animal head terminals on the handle here, which correspond very closely to the kind of animal head uh, terminal we have on certain Irish bells that I showed you initially that are of late 11th and early 12th century date. And, um, but we can't say that because these five happen to be made in Ireland, we can't say that uh, there, was no, there was no native Welsh bronze bell making industry. 
we have in the book of Plan that uh, miracle of the dog we saying that he made a bell from transmuted butter and as Mark Redmond pointed out that suggests either a lost wax casting or uh, molten raw material at the very least and uh, incidentally because we have two of these bells uh, in the Philippine Peninsula I suspect a connection with uh, the pilgrimage traffic to Bardsey um, and then a word on enshrinement very quickly we have two different kinds. We have attachment directly to the body of the bell as here, and this is one plate on this bell in the British Museum, but of course there was a second, now lost. Um, <clears throat> and we have this, this is a, of 10th century date, and it's our earliest certain example of enshrinement in this form where, object, where a metal mounts are attached directly to the body of the bell. We have other fragments of about the same period, but we can't be certain precisely what kind of shrine they relate to because the, sh the shrine can uh, consist of, of, of plates directly riveted to the bell or uh, a container uh, made to house the bell so uh, we can then define the two types as applied or autonomous those are two completely distinct forms of enshrinement so on the, on the screen at the moment that's an applied shrine and another applied shrine is the other British Museum example from Canterbury. to Prairie made in the late 11th or early 12th century. And the other kind is the autonomous, and this is our earliest certain example, made to house St. Patrick's Bell around the year 1100, this time dated securely by inscription for about that year. And as you say, we have other fragments, but whether to assign, it's not certain whether they belong to applied or autonomous shrine. So it may well be that this autonomous shrine is the earliest one in absolute terms and it's the one from which all other autonomous shrines ultimately derive. And because it's an Armagh product, it's all the more likely that innovation and initiative should be centered there. And <clears throat> as we I have another couple of images of that, just to, the bell fits within the shrine, and the bell therefore is still available for use if need arises. That's how it functions. The hole in the base plate has been made by the clapper. And then another detail of this, uh, uh, this Armagh project of around the year 1100, just to point out that the stone on the right, uh, the red stone on the right in its gold claw setting, one of the best preserved on the face of this shrine, allows us uh, uh, an insight into the nature of the workshop and perhaps the treasury of Armagh around the year 1100, because this stone and all its counterparts and a little um, closely enamel stud at the top of this shrine are from some elaborate piece of Ottonian metalwork mm -hmm. of the 11th century, something like this cross at Osney Group. They're certainly not of Irish make, and so they have been applied as part of the primary making, they're part of the shrine of St. Patrick's Bell. Um, so, th as I say, there is potentially a relative chronology that the applied shrines come first and the autonomous shrines come second. Why iron bells only and why not bronze? It might be that uh, enshrinement was straightforwardly the creative adaptation to cult purposes of bells that were superannuated, they couldn't be used for anything else. It might be that bronze bells, by their capacity to endure uh, uncorroded, seemed unlikely relics uh, in the period of their production and even in the centuries thereafter. But I think what was perhaps the key factor was a real collective sense, a real recollection, the iron bells were indeed the older type and were accessories to the lives of the great monastic founders, even if, as I believe, they were originally communally owned rather than personally. Now, a seeming exception must be mentioned finally, since it's quite famous and it's in the Wallace Collection here uh, in uh, London. This is the bell from Fawn in, in a show in a county Donegal, looking at first sight like a class two bronze bell that's been enshrined, though in my view that's not what it is. Um, I uh, can show you this a radiograph, uh, one of several produced for the Wallace Collection by the Tower Armouries, kindly made available to me by, by, by Jeremy Warren. It shows you uh, an unblemished uh, top to the bell, uh, and it's uh, interrupted only by an integral upright projection, uh, something designed from from the uh, by the original maker uh, to anchor uh, the decorated crest-like handle, the handle then afterwards itself encased in the later Middle Ages. So the bell, in other words, is contemporary entirely with 
the candle and the other mass that are in exactly the same late 11th century style. And um, we find, uh, I haven't got an image, but we find that there's a major casting flaw as well on the inside of this bell from Fawn and that the mounts uh, on the surface actually um, serve secondly, uh, cosmetically, to conceal that imperfection. And um, we find that we have others, nothing as elaborate as the from Farm, but this one from Kilmadua in County Galway is, I would say, the same thing uh, in simpler terms. It's a bell that's made to look as though it has a plique uh, mounts and little collets. It has collets to take some kind of decorative inlay, but it's all obviously made of a piece. What m might have given rise to them was, of course, the prestige of enshrined bells and bell shrines, but also, I suppose, the need to furnish altars and tombs with a view to the promotion of pilgrimage. There would have been many factors, but those are perhaps some of the main ones. So <clears throat> I hope I've sketched then adequately uh, the exceptional nature of these bells as artifacts and as the focus of investment, both material and otherwise, throughout the span of the Middle Ages and beyond. The subject, uh, as, I've, as I've hinted, it ramifies in all kinds of directions that I haven't covered this evening. Bells made by tradition, at least by famous and variably sainted people. Bells used in church consecration, in healing and as receptacles. In baptism, bells sworn upon and carried into battle as talismans. Questions of iconography and archaeological context, including burial as grave furniture and open air preservation. The terminology that applies in Latin and the vernaculars and the proper names in, in these several languages uh, that were attached to bells and that reflect both popular perception and popular reception. They're a particular interest of mine, so let me just mention that I've documented 84 of them. There are 84 such proper names. The Barnon, which means gapped one or gapped bell, is the commonest name. It appears nine times out of that 84. And my guess again is that Barn the Barnon attributed to St. Patrick was the archetype for all the others, that in other words, the name acquired prestige we have association with, with his name. But to re-emphasize the long uh, continuities that apply, let me leave you with two images. This is an image from a 15th century mural in the parish church of Stival in Brittany, <coughs> showing St. Mary Adek, this is local patron. He's administering a cure uh, by placing the bell on uh, someone's head. And here at Goulia, not too many miles away, uh, we have this same practice uh, continuing up to the present day. I think perhaps that's enough. Thank you very much indeed.